and the laundry list. Then the list goes on, as they say. But um, in all humility, just call me a child of God. Amen. If you're gonna call me something, you may be seated in the house. If you're gonna, if you're gonna call me something, just call me a child of God. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I'm reading the scripture on you. So get back up. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> just thought I'd let you get a little a little uh, break. Next thing I'll have you doing the what is it where you go around the chairs and see oh, who music chairs. Chairs. chairs musical chairs. Praise the Lord. I'm I'm reading to you the scripture that's going to be the basis for um, our message this morning. Our sister evangelist Kaye has come all the way from Montreal. She drove here to bring us this word on today yeah. and uh, I'm so happy to see her so, that smile is that's a smile that knows both the good and the bad <laughs> but chooses the good amen chooses the good I've heard her go through a lot of things but she still chooses the good amen amen, amen. amen. The scripture, now the heading in my Bible, it's Psalm 139 for those who want to read and go along with us. And the uh, heading in my Bible, I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible by Holman on this morning, is the all-knowing, ever-present God. Hey. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Bring the chairs. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Ooh. God, I thank you. He always knows what to say. He's always on time with it. He is. And I don't know if anybody was listening to what the Holy Spirit was telling me this morning. I said this morning, you can't hide anything from him. Right. You might as well tell him. <laughs> you might as well tell him. Because if you want help, that's the way you're going to get it. Yeah, he knows it. But he's not moving until he knows you trust him. Yeah. When you open up and trust the all-knowing God. He does what he does, and that is be the ever-present. Ever-present means he's not going anywhere, my brothers and sisters. No matter how much you try to hide, and I know that I said that in the spirit this morning, too. You could try to hide if you want to. You can't hide. And so, the type, I, I thank you for my little dance. My, my sister said to me, she says, you're dancing in the spirit now, but you're going to be dancing in the flesh. And, and certainly, that's, God's not going to make me pay for that one. That one was a free one. Nice. He, let me, he let me be joyful. You know, it's something, I'm sorry, I don't need to take a lot of time. Of course. But it's something where you can feel the joy of the Lord. Yeah. And you want to express the joy of the Lord. Sometimes we feel joyful, but we are embarrassed to let people know the joy we feel in our hearts. Oh, I shouldn't act like that in public. You know, I don't care. Amen. Yeah. If it offends you, so turn it off. <laughs> because you don't know when the last phrase is the last phrase. Amen. I could go home today and never be able to lift my foot again. So when I get the opportunity to give God praise, I praise it here. Yes. Amen. Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest, you are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on ah, before a word is on my tongue, hallelujah to Jesus, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. 
It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is hell, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness, my God, is not dark to you. The night shines like day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For it was you who created my inward parts. Oh, God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones are not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me. When I was formless, all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them, before a single one of them began. God, how precious your thoughts are to me, how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I'm still with you. God, if only you would kill the wicked, you bloodthirsty men, stay away from me. You invoke you, who invoke you deceitfully. Your enemies swear by you falsely. Lord, don't I hate those who hate you and detest those who rebel against you? I hate them with extreme hatred. I consider them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me into the everlasting way. And may the Lord add a blessing Amen. to the reading of his word on today. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of God. It is my extreme pleasure to pr present to some and introduce to others our sister in the Lord, who is a member of Bethel Life Center and Bethel Life International Fellowship our very own Kai Lot. Please come forward. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's uh, message is a bit long. I hope that you would uh, be patient with me. Amen. And, uh, these, these days I talk about ascension a lot. And my theme verse is for today is, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, Behold, you are there. Amen. So Psalm 139 is commonly attributed to King David. You know, David is a very unusual man. He's a shepherd, musician, warrior, king, prophet. And he's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. And David has won many battles. He has, he's king of the United Monarchy. And uh, he made great preparation for Solomon to build a temple. And from his lineage, Christ will come and, and Christ came. And he will sit on the throne of David. So, but with all the contribution that David has, I think the greatest contribution will be the Psalms. That he and he, the Psalms still touch our hearts today, right? And David used prayer and poetry to express his deep emotions, all the trial and challenges that he has, all the conflicts that he has with his enemies, uh, personal struggles. He struggled with a lot of sins and guilt, 
and his highs and lows, and people express his praise, worship, and adoration of God. And the Psalms are very pro uh, prophetic, not just poetic, but prophetic. And uh, oftentimes it's very theologically sound. Yes. And Psalm 139 was written about 1,000 years ago. Uh, the, one, not 1,000, 1,000 BCE, 3,000 years ago. There's, there's no mentioning about when he wrote, uh, when the Psalm was written during his lifetime. But uh, it's possibly during the periods of uh, spiritual fervor. And in this psalm, David was contemplating on the omniscience and omnipresence of God, on God's intimate, uh, on God's intimate knowledge of him, his relationship with God. And he just expressed this uh, sense of awe and reverence he feels towards God's presence in his life. Right. And Psalm 139 can, can be divided into four sections, four sections of six verses each. Each section points to a particular attribute of God. The first section is about the omniscient God. The second section is about the omnipresent God. The third section is about the creator God. And the fourth section is about the righteous God. And as we go through this psalm, we can see that one concept kind of act on, on top of the other. And, and this psalm is addressing directly to, to God. And David used the attributes of God and personalized it. Uh, first, uh, first section about the omniscient God. And we can imagine that it can be represented by the eye of God or the eyes of God. First one says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You may want to highlight the words search and know. Uh, in Hebrew, the word search is called haka, meaning investigate. The same word was used, by, uh, used to describe the spies who were sent to search out the land. So that's how it's called, search our heart. It's like the spies searching out the land. And uh, the, 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 in the first section, four times the word no uh, was used. And um, the word, the Hebrew word is yada. Uh, the Greek equivalent is called ginosko, meaning to know, not just internationally, but intimate knowledge in a close relationship. For example, in Genesis, it says, Adam knew Eve and she bore a son. So it's intimate knowledge as within a couple. That's how God knows us. And, but it's also an experiential knowledge. Like in Psalm 4610, it says, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. So it's ex experience and also intimate oh, knowledge. Yes. You know, God knows everything perfectly. Yes. God is not limited by knowledge. He knows every detail anywhere at all time. While we don't know about tomorrow, we are forgetting about yesterday. But David personalized this perfect knowledge of God to himself. He said, God diligently search me out, knows me exactly for who I am, examine all that is within me, and arrive at a full knowledge of my spiritual condition. Um, I wonder how God searches. Does he search with his eyes? Second Chronicles 16 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth yes. to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. First Samuel 16 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees, for a man looks at the outward appearance, yes. but the Lord looks at the heart. Mm. Hebrews 4.13. It says, no creature is hidden from his sight, yes. but all are naked and exposed to his eyes through the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. Yes, amen. So it's, it's like God is searching us by scanning on our hearts and arrive at a 
deeper level of understanding than just facts. Mm -hmm. God doesn't just know facts. He That's knows right. more than that. Yes. Perhaps we can call this the divine truths. It's the condition of our spirit, body, and soul. And Haggai says, God is a God of all seeing. Elroy, all seeing, all knowing. We see in the book of uh, Ezekiel, the cherry baby. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Revelation, the four living creatures, they, their entire bodies, even their wings, <laughs> were covered with eyes. eyes. Eyes in every direction. Yes. We are not sure about that, <laughs> the, about God, but is it, he's all seeing because he yes. has eyes in every direction. Yes. We don't know. Amen. Verse two and three, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and acquainted with all my ways. You know all my postures, actions, habits, patterns. You not only know, but you are acquainted, familiar with all my ways. Yes. When I rise up, when I sit down, when I go out, when I go to bed, you know all. Verse three says, you comprehend my path. The word comprehend here in Hebrew is sarah, meaning to scatter, to fan, or to willow. Willowing is a way that we separate the grains and the chaff. We throw both into the air. Yeah. The chaff would be blown away by the wind, and the heavier grains would fall and, and would remain. So willowing is a way, <clears throat> it, it's, a, it's a careful, thorough process. That, that and this is it describes how God discern and understand all aspects of our life by willowing. Mm -hmm. And I can uh, help but think of this verse, these verses from the book of Job, Job seven seventeen to eighteen. What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them? Every moment. Every moment. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> and we know in the scripture who has the willowing for. Eh? Yeah. Matthew 3, 3, 12. His willowing for is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Mm. So he has the willowing for. Verse, verse three also can be translated as you scrutinize my path. So as willowing, separating the grains and, and chaff, you examine me closely to discern the true nature of my actions. You know the path that I take, if it is righteous. You know why I take this path, how, to where, with whom, you know the situations, circumstances, and all the details. Wow. Benson commentary says, you watch me from every side like a hunter. My God. And like soldiers beseeching his enemies by setting watches around them. That's how God watches us. We all know us. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 2 says, you understand my thoughts are far off. All my secret counsels, designs, imaginations, you perceive them. You discern them, even before any thoughts are properly formed in my mind. Mm. Verse 4 says, For there is not a word on my tongue. Behold, O oh Lord, you know it you all know together. It. You know it. Sometimes we, did, we see this in couples, eh? You know the words that I'm about to say, even there is not a word on my tongue. So that it's a, it speaks of God's yes. omniscience, yes. intimate knowledge, yes. and foreknowledge knows what, what, we, yes. what we are thinking even Amen. when you know the forms are not the, the the thoughts are not properly formed yet and even not a word on our tongue he knows and in verse 5 says you hatched me behind and before or you hear me in behind and before yes so with his perfect knowledge of us of our thoughts of our words of our actions what does he do with it so the Hebrew word used for hatch and him is tor, meaning adversary. 
it, it means to confine, to bind, to be siege, enclosed, and wrap as you would do to an adversary. So you wrap me around, there is no escape. Mm. It speaks of God's um, all seeing, all disposing providence. And verse 5 says, you lay your hand upon me, so you keep me with a strong hand in your sight, under your power, to preserve, to protect, to uphold, and to defend. Verse 6, verse six says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot <laughs> attain it. Yes. God's omniscience is transcendent, unattainable indescribable. We cannot comprehend them with, with, with our three-pound brain. We That's cannot right. comprehend them. <laughs> what does it mean by knowing everything perfectly for eternity? How, do, how does he gather and store and process all the information? You know, we, we don't understand. That's why the psalmist says, it's high. I cannot attain I it. Cannot attain it's it. too wonderful for me, too deep, too mm -hmm. powerful, too immense. And then we just express this veneration and awe of the infinite God. Section 2 talks about the omnipresent God. And we can imagine that it's represented by the body, by his body. God is everywhere. Right? We know God is spirit. In John 4, 24, says God is spirit. If he has a body, if he had a body, we can imagine it's very large, mm -hmm. boundless, it occupies all the places and spaces. Isaiah 66 one says, this is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? A.W. Tozer, in knowledge of the holy, he wrote, God is infinite. His being knows no limits in his in his infinitude, he surrounds the finite creation and contains it. Mm -hmm. So there are two concepts about us physical beings in relation to God. Acts 17, 27 to 28 says, says, God is actually not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and have not our being. being. That is Apostle Paul who said that he, he was quoting from Epinemites, Epinemites um, of Crete. It's, he's a sixth century Greek philosopher and poet. And he's talking about the omniscient, um, omnipresence of God and, uh, and the dependence of all things on him. But in fact, the, the contemporary Near Eastern cultures actually think that there are many gods. Mm -hmm. And each God is limited locally. For example, in the story of First Kings 20, the Syrian army, the Syrian army were, def were defeated by uh, the Israelites on their hills. And the Syrian says, their gods are gods of the hills. Uh -huh. And we're going to, well, next time we fight them, we're going to fight them in the plains because their, their God of hills is not God of the plains. And we, we have better chance of winning them there. In another example is 2 Kings 17, when the northern Israel was being deported by the Assyrians, and the Assyrian king was settling in um, a, a nation, a people from other nations and put them in Samaria. And they were killed and they were attacked by lions. And it, so, and it was interpreted as a sign that they offended the local deity. Mm -hmm. And so the king is, is king of Assyria, sent an Israelite priest to, to teach those limb settlers the, 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 the laws of God. And they say it's the custom of the God of the land that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the, the, um, the concept of God is limited locally. The, that is the, con, uh, the their contemporary uh, Eastern culture, uh, what they what what uh, they think. But David imagined that he arrived at the at a correct knowledge of God centuries before that. He understood that God is unlimited, unlimited. In, 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 in His presence, in, and He's not locally bound, and He's omnipresent. Everywhere. 
is everywhere. And when we, when Christ was glorified, when the pro promise of Holy Spirit is given to each one of us, and we now have the indwelling of God, First Corinthians six nineteen, it says, "Do you know? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? Mm -hmm. You're not your own." So we, the, this is the concept that we are in him and he is in us. Verse 7 and 8 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I, send, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. Mm -hmm. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. So he's saying I cannot imagine going to a place where God cannot reach. Mm -hmm. His spirit, his presence is always with me. So this 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 concept again that you hear me in. And and one commentator says, when Jonah sought to flee from his presence, he only found himself brought more absolutely and more perceptibly into his presence. Mm -hmm. So when Jonah was trying to run away from the he more. was running into, running into, into him anywhere. even more. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and uh, even entering into another spiritual realm, other dimensions, ascending to heaven, descending to shield, you are there. Yes. And I, I guess, I, I think David was really trying to run away from God. Verse 9 <laughs> and 10 says, if I take the wings of the morning mm -hmm. and dwell in the uttermost parts of the seas. Behold, there your hand shall lead yes. me and your hand shall hold. So the wings of the morning means uh, when the sun rises, the, the, the sunlight would sweep across a vast distance from east to west very quickly. Yes. So he's saying, I, if I got the wings of the morning, if I can run like that, then yeah, I can fly like <laughs> And then, but even if I have the wings of the morning, from, uh, can travel from east to west very quickly, yes, even in the uttermost parts of the sea, the most remote areas of the earth, even there, your hand shall hold me. So no distance, no high, no depth can separate us from God. Amen. Romans 8, 38 to 39. Yes. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, yes. nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the, from the love of God so that is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing. Hallelujah. Nothing. Verse 11 and 12 talks about darkness. And darkness here can mean two things. Darkness can mean concealing. I cannot even hide in the light or in darkness. Darkness can conceal me and my evil deeds from the sight of man. But darkness has to flee in his presence because wow. God is light. He turns light to day and makes all things manifest yes. before him. Amen. Darkness can also mean suffering the dark light of the soul. This term was first used by St. John of the Cross, a Spanish monk in 1577. When he says dark light of the soul, he, he described uh, his spiritual journey, which includes sufferings, inner turmoil, even a profound sense of emptiness and disorientation as necessary purification steps on the path to union with God. So he is going through this dark night of the soul in order to, to uh, come closer to God at the end. And we know that actually God is the creator of light and darkness. Yes. It's written in, 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 uh, in the first chapter of Genesis. And also in Isaiah 45, seven says, I form the light and create darkness. Yes. I make peace and create evil. Yes. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
So did God create a dark light of the soul experience for David to purify his soul? Mm. So to bring him in closer communion with God. With God. So is this why the reason he was trying to escape? Get away. <laughs> Get away. <laughs> Where can I flee? So uh, section three, verse 13 to 18, talks about the creator God. And we can imagine that it's represented by the hand of God. And uh, he, he, in this section, he described his relation as the creation to the creator, the maker. David said, you formed me. Yes. You weaved me. You need me in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your words. I was made in secret. I was skillfully wrong. So all these terms are terms of creation. And there's something special about man uh, than other creations. In Genesis, God spoke and things came into existence. He said, let there be light and there was not. Yes. But when it comes to man, he has to form. form. Yes, yes. He, he formed with Hallelujah. The, the earth and made him into his image. Yes. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Is, uh, then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created mm -hmm. them. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So mankind has God's fingerprints all over them. Yes. And we are not only made in his image, but we also have the breath, breath of God. God. Yes. And I, I took this from, took this passage from Facebook, I don't know who wrote it, but it says this, when God wanted to create fish, he spoke to the sea. When God wanted to create trees, he spoke to the earth. But when God wanted to create man, he turned it to himself. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So if you take a fish out of the water, it will die. Mm -hmm. When you remove a tree from the soil, it will also die. Likewise, when man is disconnected from God, he dies. Mm -hmm. So God is our natural environment we were created to live in his presence we are we have to connect to him Amen. because it is only in him that we that life exists so it, it it brings this concept of creation and environment his image is in us and we are living in him hebrews 1 3 says he the son he is the radiance of the glory of God mm. and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So we can imagine that um, we, um, Christ not only has the exact, uh, is the exact imprint of God, but also he's upholding the, the environment that we live in. Yes. And we are to be conformed to the image of the sun. So I, I think one day we will also uphold part of the universe, Amen. the environment that we live in. And back to creation, we thought that creation ended in the first six days. But according to the scripture, no. So this is the mystery of human birth, that every human birth is a divine creation, yes, according to the scriptures. And he works on us even before conception. Right? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 1 5. Yes. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew I you. Knew. Or I chose you. Before oh. you were born, I set you apart. So, in, in, in also in this section, there is uh, this concept of hiddenness and intimacy. David used these terms, my inner parts, 
in my mother's womb, in secret, in the lowest parts of the earth. Verse 13 in King James Version actually reads, But thou hast possessed my reins, my reins. Mm. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word reins literally means kidneys in Hebrew. It denotes the inward part, the mind, the soul, the seats of desires, mm -hmm. affections, passions. So the innermost recesses of his being has have been made by God. And therefore, God must be able to see all that, that it's in the very depth of his soul. So David just described this intimacy that he had with God in the most secret part, in the most secret condition, yet unborn. He was under the control and guardianship of God. He, you, thou possessed my rings. So even his innermost part, God has control and possessed. So this is the, so God is intimately involved in the formation and even ownership of it, of the his innermost being yes. even at the very beginning. So this there's a deep connection between creation and the creator. Yes, amen. Verse 14 says, <clears throat> I'll praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. Marvelous are your words, and that my soul knows very well. Very well. In contrast to verse 6, verse 6 says, such knowledge too is too Truly. high. Yes, I cannot attain. Mm -hmm. But we know that in verse six, God uh, David was uh, attempting to wrap uh, wrap around God internaturally, mm -hmm. but he cannot wrap around God uh, internaturally. It's too high. He cannot That's attain right. it. But then in verse fourteen, it says that my soul knows very well. My inner being innately knows the Creator who needs who needs me in the secret place. Mm -hmm. So the soul knows the truth. Yes, the soul knows God, and probably the first thing the the soul knows is God, the Creator. Yes, and we cannot wrap around God with the mind, but that's right. We, our soul knows, knows right well. the truth. Amen. In Romans, it talks in Romans 120, it talks about God's attribute as a maker can be clearly seen in creation. Mm -hmm. It says, Romans 120 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power yes. that God had, so that they are without excuse. Ours. But David, what David says is deeper. David is not looking at the creation as, as a third person. He's talking about himself, the one being himself, the one being created as a created being. Mm -hmm. He was made to know God. Yes. In, in, in while he was in his mother's womb. And, and he's, he's so new. He was in this secret workshop that God yes. is working with. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, and one commentator says, now, if God made us with care and sovereignty in our most vulnerable state, mm -hmm. how much more we should be able to trust him Amen. as he directs our pathways Amen. through this pilgrimage of life. And furthermore, this new birth that we have as Christians, born again in spirit, is even more mysterious than the first physical birth that ex that. It tells us about God's wisdom and his love towards us. Verse 15 talks about the, the human body. It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret mm -hmm. and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the oh, earth. Yeah. So it's a po poetic description. I, I was skillfully wrought. It's a poetic description about uh, Veins, muscles, yes. nerves, and all of this. And in in the Hebrew word is rakam, literally mean embroider. So he we can say um, it can be translated as I was embroidered with great skill. Mm -hmm. So when we when we do embroidering, mm -hmm. uh, we we deck with color. We when we variegate 
a garment, we weave uh, threads of various colors. So it's like the way that God weaves our body, how, yes. how the human body come together, the muscles, the nerves, the veins, and, and all this, it's like weaving together. It's like the uh, embroiderment. So that uh, even our human yes. frame, human body, yes. it's a delicate, the beautiful work. Yes, amen. Um, and verse 16 says, verse 16 is a difficult verse. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all mm. were written. Written. The in days place. fashioned for me. Wow. When as yet there were none of them. Mm. The NIV translation says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Amen. Um, the first verse says, My substance being yet unformed. It is actually translated from a Hebrew word called golem. Golem means rolled up, folded up, wrapped together undeveloped. Sometimes it's even translated as a ball, a ruler mass. So it, it, it tells it, it's, it's the embryo that he's referring to. It's like all the members of the, uh, of the body is still wrapped up. It's still in this wrapped up state. It has not assumed its distinct form yet. So right. when he was talking about himself, like in, in this kind, it's in this state, yeah, like a ruler mass, a ball, and even in these days, the eyes of the Lord see it, and the eyes of the Lord see all its parts distinctly. So you can say that it can be translated as your eyes saw my fetus. Mm -hmm. And some argue that life begins with the first heartbeat. The cardiac tissue starts to pulse at around five to six weeks of pregnancy, registering as a heartbeat on the ultrasound. Although the heart has not uh, fully developed. Mm -hmm. Here, what David says is that even mm -hmm. as a rude Mars, God recognized him as an entity, mm -hmm. a human being. Even when he was formless, he was like, was wrapped it up like that, like a yeah. ball, yeah. rude Mars. And we can say that biblically speaking, life begins at conception. Not life begins at whatever weeks that they talk about. You know? mm -hmm. Amen. And verse 16, uh, because the Hebrew grammar is somewhat different, it goes like object, verb, and subject. And render word for word, it gives my fetus, so your eyes. And it is suggests that it, it, is part, is it, is, it is possible that. Even even our eyes are not fully developed. Mm -hmm. Even in its, in its still in still in this state. row in, in its day of ball shape mm -hmm. has so seen deep. the Lord. Yes, my God. And encounter God. Mm -hmm. Which is why David says, My soul knows very well. Yes. He begs the question, have we seen God before we were born? Yes. Did we know God? Before the glory, you come in the boom. Verse 16 says, And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So all the days of my life were already written, yes. each coming into being according to the divine will. Already written. Hallelujah. But does it mess up with your thinking? My future has already, already been, been written, written in the past. Yes. Yes. You have no My control over it. <laughs> it had nothing to do with it. So this book is the allusion to the book of an architect or a draftsman. Before he begins his work, he draws, he his plans, he sketches to, to, uh, for the direction of the workman. So God saw my whole life when I was still not fully developed. Mm -hmm. All my future was known to God and was already written down. The plan of the body was drawn, or the parts of it described. It. The days of my life were all laid out. How I should look, how long should I live, 
What should I be? What would be the events in, of my life? Mm. And one commentator says, all of this is a clear expression of the truth that there is an ideal plan of life. Providentially, marked out for every individual. individual. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, right. created right. in Christ Jesus for good works, That's right. which God prepared beforehand, beforehand. and we, that we should walk in them. Yep. Yep. He prepared them and we walk in them. Verse 17 and 18. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them? If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. The word translate as precious actually means heavy, weighty. How weighty are your thoughts to me? Mm. So we, um, Hallelujah. how weighty, eh? yes. how weighty are your thoughts to me? Cognitive psychologists estimate that we, an average person, has 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day. And this translates to roughly 3,000 thoughts per hour, assuming that we are awake for 24 hours. Because when we have the number will be smaller, lower when we are sleeping. So imagine the thoughts of God for each one of us. Imagine the quality and quantity compared to our own. Mm. One commentator says it's impenetrable, unsearchable, overwhelming, infinitely beyond ours, more valuable and important. Uh, if I were to project my thoughts on screen, it would be terrible to watch. <laughs> I, we don't think right, we, uh, you know. But God's thoughts in terms of quality and quantity, indescribable. Yes, amen. And he thought about us even before conception. His thought towards us are continuous every day for our good, for our provision, yes. our blessings, for our family, for our plans and purposes. We can compare this to thoughts that would occupy the mind of a parent towards his or her child to provide for them, teaching them, anticipating their needs. and But we can imagine that God has even more numerous thoughts towards each one of us because he knows us better yeah. and he loves us more. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Yes. Plans to give you hope. In the future. Yes. He also has thoughts about our salvation, our born again life, to prepare us for eternity, right? He's taking all the care necessary to grow and mature us. He's perfecting us in Christ, sanctifying us, pruning us, mm -hmm. molding us, conforming us to the image of his son, and equipping us to do his will. Yes. He also has thoughts about our future generations. Psalm 33, 11, the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. Amen. The purpose of his heart through all generations. He knows our thoughts, but we don't know his. Okay. <laughs> unless he reveals them to us. Ooh, I say, sorry, sorry. Isaiah 55, 8, 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. No. Neither are your ways my oh, ways, way. declares the Lord. As the high. heavens are higher than mm. the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your the thoughts. Lord. Amen. So David meditate on God's thoughts towards him. He is sweet, comforting, his loving kindness, his covenant grace, his promise. His gracious duty. That's why he said, truly how great is the sum of them. Yes. And verse 18 says, when I awake, I'm still with you. 
Mm. We can imagine that David meditates a lot, mm. continuously, on God, on his law and statute, uh, day and night. These are probably the last thoughts when he lies down and he stirs when he, he rises. And he, wakes up. and he wakes up from whether it's from sleep or from his uh, meditation. And he's, he, he's, he's continuously thinking on this three theme. He's still op, uh, occupied in contemplating the mystery of his being. Amen. And he, he finds himself still in his presence and says, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. And he, 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 his presence is con continual. He's always present. He never sleeps, never slumber. He's unchanging. And so that, that is, he's, he's still wake up in the presence of, of, the, Lord. Lord. Amen. of the Lord. Section four deals with the righteous God, and we can uh, we can imagine that uh, it's represented by the heart of God, and uh, God, the inner essence of God is righteousness and holiness. No, it's okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, His essence is righteousness and holiness of ethical integrity and compassion, just as the heart will pump life-giving blood to the entire body, righteousness is the moral core that sustains and gives life to all of God's actions and judgments. Mm -hmm. And in these six verses, we can see uh, David's indignation against the enemies of God and mm -hmm. against wickedness. Basically, he made two prayers. He cried against the wickedness in the world and against the wickedness within himself. Yes. And throughout the book of Psalms, David made prayers against the wicked and is commonly called the imprecatory Psalms. And these Psalms contain curses mm -hmm. and prayers for the punishment and the downfall of his enemies. There are four characteristics of imprecatory psalms. It calls for justice. Mm -hmm. The psalms are, it, it call upon the justice of God. To God, call upon God to enact justice. And second, it's about emotional intensities. They are marked by uh, intense emotions, anger, frustration, longing for vindication. They have expression of trust in God, trusting in God's sovereignty and justice. And fourth, it deals with, oftentimes it, it arises from personal or national crisis. And, but we need to understand that the purpose of Psalms is to give voice to human emotions. Amen. Imprecatory Psalms are powerful, raw expression, or a raw expression of the Psalmist's desire for God's justice and intervention and it's also a way to invoke the covenant relationship that God has with Israel in, in particular. But we know that um, Christ teaches us to love our enemies, yeah. pray for our persecutors, emphasizing on uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. The ministry of Christ is a ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. We hate sins, but not the sinners. That's right. However, sins should grieve us. We should not be desensitized, desensitized towards sins. But we also understand why David prays in, in such a way because he, 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 still, he was dealing with uh, spiritual warfare. There, there's this anti-Christ, anti-anointing, uh, spirit operating yes. against him. We are not wrestling against flesh, flesh and blood. blood. So uh, that is one of the reasons why he was praying like this. And, but let's go back to the verses. In, and verse 19 to 21 says, how does, um, we try to look at how David described the wicked in his days. Uh, David says, the, the wicked is bloodthirsty, mm -hmm. speak 
against God wickedly. Take God's name in vain. Mm -hmm. Hate God. Rise up against God. So th these are the the the, the, the wickedness in the, the wicked that he called the wicked how how uh, they are. And um, he even says, "Do I do not I hate them? Oh Lord, that hate thee." So notice that David did not take a neutral position. Uh -huh. He makes it even personal. No. He mocks the God haters. He, he's taking no pleasure in those who, who rebelled against God or opposing his righteousness and sovereignty. So David, as a warrior for God, he was contending with those who contend with God. With God. Mm -hmm. In our Christian walk, there is a delicate balance. We don't want to be like the Pharisees that reject the sinners, the prostitutes, right. the, the tax collectors. We don't want to uh, reject, reject people. Yes. But we should be able to exercise enough discernment to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Yes. To know that their thinking is often futile, spiritually speaking. Romans 121 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and, thinking. and their foolish hearts were darkened. Mm -hmm. Amos 3 3 mm -hmm. Can two walk together. together except they be agreed? First Corinthians 15:33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Good That's right. And we, we we see in this psalm that David did not contemplate on the origin of evil and its development. He did not ask if God is good, why there is evil. He was he just accepted the way it is. And we know in the book of Genesis, on each day of creation, it says, God saw that it was good. It was all good. Angels and mankind were made perfect until they disobeyed yes. or rebelled. And I believe all other creations obey. You know, when, when God told the animals to come into the ark, they went. Yes, they God told the, uh, the raven to, to feed Elijah, it went. Yes. God told the lion to attack the uh, disobedient prophet, he, he, he did. Right. So, so the creation, all creation obeyed oh, God, man. except that we are given free will and make our choices. Yes. If Satan was created as the anointed cherub who covers, but it is said about him, you were created in your ways. You were perfect in your ways mm -hmm. from the day you were created, created till iniquity was found in you. So evil is the byproduct of free will. Mm -hmm. And we can imagine that from God's perspective, the eye of God is grieved by the presence of evil. But, you know, the wheat and the tares are to be grown together. That's right. Until the last day, which is the time of separation. The tares and the wheat, the sheep and the goats, yes. you know, the chaff and the grains. So David said in verse 19, depart from me, ye bloody men. And, uh, you know, this sounds familiar. Depart from me, mm -hmm. workers, of iniquity. workers of iniquity. Mm -hmm. That's the way that God would uh, judge the people, even yes. those who call on his name. And we are not going to debate concerning predestination and free will. I just want to highlight this that yes, all the days, all our days are written in our books mm -hmm. because of God's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. But there's an other book called the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. And it's uh, mentioned many times in, in the book of Revelation, Revelation, the book of life. Whether or not our name is written in the book of the Lamb or the book of life, we change the final outcome. That's right. Revelation 20, 12 to verse 12 to 14, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, 
and books were open. Books were open. Then another book was open, mm -hmm. which is the Book of Life. Yes. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Mm -hmm. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Yes. Then death and Hades, <coughs> Hades well, were yeah. thrown into the lake of fire. Yes. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the, the, the lake, lake of fire. So we can still make our choice to have our names written in the book of life. Amen. Um, the last two verses, uh, David's prayer, and it's actually the very climax of the psalmist's contemplation. It's a prayer that consists of four petitions. Search me, O God, mm -hmm. know, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So David basically repeat the same, same thing as the first verse. Yes. He asked God to search, search. and to know him. Huh. Search me and know me. Yes. But God already knows <laughs> our heart. God already knows. He knows us thoroughly. But we are strangers to ourselves. Amen. We rely on him to reveal to us our thoughts, our intentions. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Above all. And desperately wicked. Yes. Who can know it? Who can know it? So we all need self-knowledge. Hmm. If only we know ourselves the way God yes. knows us. You know, sometimes we don't know ourselves until we are tested. Peter thought he would never forsake Christ. But he denied it. But he did. That's right. We don't know ourselves. So David is inviting God to do what only God can do. To search and to prove him by his word and spirit. Yes. To examine him closely. To dig deep in his heart. To shed light on his heart. Not out of pride or self-righteousness. But in the form of cons confession. Yes. With sincerity. Yes. So that he might not live in delusion, self-deception, or cherish any improper feelings and desires. Amen. So one commentator put it this way, that David is inviting the presence of God into his heart to illuminate all the darkest places and recesses of his heart. Mm -hmm. To overcome the creeping swarms of microscopic sins <laughs> that threaten to destroy a man's soul. My Lord, my Lord, my yeah. Lord. A creeping swarm of microscopic sins. A creeping swarm. That a threaten swarm. to destroy a man's soul. My God. Mm. They're there. <laughs> They're in there. Yes, we need, we need cleansing. We do. Yes. You yeah. have to search us and show us. Yes. 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 So God, um, and he also says, as a bleacher who spreads some piece of stained cloth in the gracious sunshine, sprinkles it with pure water of heaven, that all the things may melt away. Mm -hmm. So God comes to illuminate all the dark rooms in our heart and, and cleans it. So David is inviting God to, inviting the divine scrutiny whereby God searched the inner man by the eye yeah. and the divine inspection whereby God tried and proved him as metals in fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. His desire is to be proved it and tested because he's yearning for purity. purity he yes. wants to please God. He is delighted to do his will. Psalm 36, 2 says, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Mm -hmm. Test my heart and my mind. Mm -hmm. So God is asking God to search out all his secret sins. Fear, rebellion, resistance, anything that opposes God. And lead him to repentance, inner transformation, and holiness. Amen. 
And his prayer is that if there's any idolatry in him, mm. any unfaithfulness, any tendency, any tendency to go back from God, anything in his heart that will alienate him from the true God. And he wants to know, he wants to be searched. No. And he submits also. He also, on the, on the other hand, he also submits to the trials by any external means of his true character and nature. Intentions, imaginations, thoughts, desires, affections. And he accept, he would accept the discipline and the correction that follows. It's like a metal in a heated furnace. All the heartless will melt, yes. and the dross can be removed. Mm, that's right. And there are three purposes of testing. It's to bring forth the righteousness. Mm -hmm. Mordecai 3.3, 3, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. We find them like gold and silver. They will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. It's also to purify our faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we know that even Abraham was tested. Yes. He, his faith was tested. He waited 25 years for his son Isaac to be born. And when his son has grown, and God asked him to offer, offer up your son on Mount Moriah, and he, he did, and, and he was stopped by the angel, but he, he did. He was believing that God could raise the dead. Yes. And so he's, his faith was tested many times. Yes. And thirdly, the, th the third purpose of testing is that the, the liquid gold in the crucible will become so pure that it reflects the image of the refiner. Yes. Second Corinthians three eighteen, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Yes. Mm. The last verse is contrasting, verse 24, it's contrasting the way of wickedness with the way everlasting. Uh, one commentator rendered wickedness as forced labor, forced labor. Since forced labor is grievous labor, it comes to mean sorrow, pain, trouble, grief which makes sense because sin enslaves people mm -hmm. and has painful consequences. Yes. The wicked way is translated as the way of sorrow, mm -hmm. the way of pain, the way of grief or trouble, the way of the idol, way of iniquity, way of falsehood, heinous or rebellious way. It is called the way of grief, because it involves either bitter repentance or severe chastisement. Mm -hmm. The wage of sin is death. Yes. So it is a path of ruin, destruction, and death. In contrast, the way everlasting means the ancient way, yes. the perpetual way. Jeremiah 6.16 6, says, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Yes. But you say, we will not walk in it. Mm. I think the most ancient path would be the, would be the path when God was walking with Adam yeah. and Eve. Yes. In, in, in the Garden of Eden, yes. in the breeze of the day. I presume that that, would, that is the path of close friendship mm -hmm. with God. It's like Enoch. Enoch yes. walked with God and he then was not he, he was taken up. So that is an ancient path. Now I believe ancient path can also mean a faith role, the Hebrews 11 role. 
the road yeah. that the saints have traveled to live the, the known and dive into the unknown. Yes. In, in the in, in the faith journey of Abraham also, he left Haran to Canaan from his father's inheritance mm -hmm. to heavenly father's inheritance from his own land to become a sojourner in the promised land. Yes. Hebrews 11, 8, 9 says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed it and went, without knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the promised land as a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Amen. So it is a faith road. And I believe it's also a crossroad. Crossroad, yes. Take up your cross and follow. And follow. It's a narrow path mm -hmm. through the narrow gate. The way everlasting or the ancient path is also described elsewhere in scripture as path of righteousness, way of holiness, path of life, path of light, path of mercy and truth, way of wisdom, way of peace, way to Zion. So here, uh, what some commentators says, what way everlasting it means. The way everlasting is the good old way, the way that endures, the way of righteousness, way of holiness, the ancient path, the timeless path. The old path is tested and proven to, to be good. Amen. Some said it was written in man's heart from the beginning of the Amen. world. The way of godliness is pleasing to God, profitable to us. We end in everlasting life. All the saints desire to be kept and led in this way, and they may that they may not miss it, turn out of it, or tire in it. It is a path to eternal peace, rest, and endless pleasure. And I, I can think of Eden. Eden means pleasure, delight. So th this is the path to endless pleasure. It is often simply called the way. Mm -hmm. Psalm 25, 8 says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the in way. The way. Mm -hmm. the way everlasting is a path of antiquity, which we may tread forever and leads to eternal life. It is a continuous path, which we may steadily pursue. A journey that begins here and continues forevermore. Amen. Uh, even death would not interrupt the journey of the righteous. That's right. It is the same journey continue as when we cross a lava stream and are on the same path still. Mm -hmm. So even when you die, you it's still can on tread time. on this path of righteousness. That's yes. why it's called way everlasting. Amen. We are continuously on this path. In the New Testament, Christians are referred to as the followers of the way. Of the way. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. Christ is the only true way to eternal life. It's the path, it's the path of faith, true, truth, and godliness, in which the Lord leads his people, as a father does his child, as the shepherd his flock. And notice that. David asks, if there is any wicked way in me, wickedness is within us. Mm -hmm. It's innate. But when it comes to the way everlasting, we have to be led into it. It's a way that we cannot enter by ourselves. Like a blind person, we need to be guided to walk in this righteous path. Psalm 23, 3 says, he leads me in the path of righteousness yes. for his name's, his name's sake. sake. So we are blessed to have his word and the Holy Spirit Amen. to guide us. So to conclude, and I want to say that Psalm 139, uh, David reach, reaches a profound understanding of God through meditation and contemplation. And he draws on his personal experiential ex knowledge of God. And he expresses it in a song that directly addresses and worship God. So this psalm reflects 
an ultimate um, communion with God. And uh, I will end with a couple of, words, couple of verses. Psalm 8, 4 to 5. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You make him a little lower than the angels or God, Elohim. You crown him with glory and honor. Isaiah 35, 8. And a highway shall be there. It shall be called a way of holiness. Yes. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Amen. So thank you for this. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Woo! Awesome. 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 Thank you for the patience. Oh, for the love. Oh. I was a record button. Wow. wow.